I never met my uncle. Hell, honestly, I never knew he existed until he died. My parents passed away in a car wreck when I was still an infant, and most of my life had been spent bouncing from one lousy foster home to another. Family services seemed certain that I had no living relatives, so I had been fairly shocked when a lawyer sent me a letter informing me that my uncle had passed away, leaving me with an undisclosed inheritance. As I sit across from Mr. Naismith, my uncle's estate lawyer, my frustration with the man began to swell. He stared down at stacks of paper babbling away, and I couldn't understand a damn word he was saying. I'd been born deaf, but could read lips very well. While I had explained this to the man at the beginning of our conversation, Mr. Naismith seemed to forget my condition. Mr. Naismith, if you could look at me while you talk, I can read your lips to follow along. The man looked at me and smiled apologetically as he ran a hand through his thinning hair. You could easily see the discomfort and embarrassment on his face as he realized he had done it again. I felt a pang of guilt for being angry with him. He had done his best to stay mindful of my need to see his mouth as he spoke. The sheer amount of paperwork on his desk must have made his mind wander. I'm sorry, Mr. Kirkwood. Your uncle was deaf as well. You would think I could remember such things, but I am scatterbrained. Again, my apologies. As I said, your uncle has left you a reasonably large sum of money, a house on a 20-acre lot, and all of the possessions within the home. There is a detailed summary of all the items within the home. Do you have any questions? I sat dumbfounded before the messy desk. My life had never been an easy one. Disability aside, the foster care system hadn't set me up for success, and I had spent my early 20s floundering before I finally managed to get a job working from home as a medical transcriptionist. The pay was decent for a job that didn't require a degree, but I still struggled to make ends meet. Now, unexpectedly, I was flush with cash and a spacious home. Yes, I said hesitantly. Did you know my uncle well? This is pretty damned confusing. I spent my entire youth in foster care, the boarding school, before being put out on my own, and I never heard of him. It just seems as though if he felt comfortable leaving me his estate, he would have reached out when I was young. Sweat was beating on the lawyer's head as he nodded and listened to me speak. The apologetic smile drained away from his face, and I could tell his mind was reeling to find a reasonable answer to my questions. It wasn't fair to put him in that position, but even as an adult, I was hurt and confused to learn I had a wealthy relative who left me in an orphaned limbo. Edison, your uncle was a quiet man, and while I knew your uncle Miles for many years, I can't say I knew him well. He was a unique man, lived on that massive tract of land in the forest, and rarely, if ever, left his house. He wasn't overly friendly. Whenever we spoke, it was the bare minimum with no small talk. In fact, the only business I've ever done with him was establishing this estate transfer to you upon his death. If he knew you were orphaned, he never mentioned it to me. But this transfer of ownership was established only months after you were born. I wish I could tell you more. He tossed a key ring on the desk in my direction, and I scooped them up. Your uncle said there will be a binder explaining some of the particulars for caring for the property. Good luck, Edison, and I'm sorry for your loss. I walked through the open door and toward my paint-peeling Toyota Corolla, my mind a symphony of confusion. I'm sorry for your loss. I hadn't known the man. The keys to my dead uncle's house jingled on my finger and the bank transfer booklet bounced in my pocket. He was a stranger and it didn't feel like a loss. It felt like a gain. It hadn't been my plan to travel to my uncle's estate immediately, but Mr. Naismith informed me that one of the stipulations of accepting the inheritance was to take up residence in the house immediately. A moving service had already been hired to collect my belongings from my apartment, few as they were. They would be delivered within the week. Moving in so rapidly seemed pointless, 
but I had no interest in arguing against my first taste of financial stability. The drive took over two and a half hours, and it was nearly dark before I reached the gate at the edge of the property. Mr. Naismith had given me the security code information in a wax-sealed envelope, and I cracked it open before hammering a ridiculously long sequence into the keypad. Metal squealed as the gate rattled to life, opening a passage onto the leaf-covered driveway before me. I drove slowly down the drive, squinting in the failing light of the house in the distance. It sat directly in the center of the 20-acre lot. The landscape was bare and flat, void of trees or bushes. I laughed a bit in my mind that a reasonably wealthy man like my deceased uncle wouldn't even spring for a bit of landscaping on the barren plot. It shouldn't surprise me, I thought. If he didn't want to spend money on a few bushes or trees, why am I shocked he left me in a boarding school for years? The headlights of my car landed mutely on the single-story farmhouse at the center of the property. Thick strands of ivy crept up the dark bricks and licked at the bottom of the metal roof. Heavy black shutters were fastened tightly over the large windows dotted along the front of the house. The same strands of ivy grew in and out of the slats, showing that the windows likely hadn't been opened for years. I cut the engine on the car and jumped out, grabbing a small duffel bag from the back seat. Before I headed to my uncle's home, I stopped by my apartment and gathered a few things. Mr. Naismith told me that basic provisions had already been left at the house for my arrival, but I hadn't been sure if that would include changes of clothes or toiletries. Sliding the bag strap over my shoulder, I turned and headed toward the front door, the key ring gripped tightly in my pocket. The house key slid easily into the door, and I was about to turn the lock when a pungent smell overwhelmed me. A sweet and sickening smell filled my nose, and my eyes began to water. Someone was rotting nearby, and the smell was so intense that I felt as though I might be nauseous. My rational mind begged me to go inside the house, but my curiosity was too great. The area around the house was flat and empty, so the offending source should be easy to find. If I was lucky, I thought. Perhaps my uncle had left a shovel to scoop up whatever was filling the air with the foul odor. My duffel bag hit the ground beside my feet, and I stepped off the edge of the low porch to look around the sides of the house. Faint sunlight struggled over the horizon as night began to settle in. I pulled my cell phone from my pocket and turned on the flashlight to scan the yard. LED light washed over the dry grass, piercing the evening dark like a lighthouse on the edge of the sea. As I moved toward the corner of the house, the fetid reek of decomposition began to grow, so I pulled the neck of my t-shirt over my nose to stop myself from losing my cheap gas station dinner. I walked slowly, scanning the light from side to side searching for the source. My heart began to thud heavily in my chest. It wasn't as though I had never seen a dead animal before, but some strange energy in the air here made my brain scream that something wasn't quite right. Intrusive thoughts of discovering a dead vagrant were beginning to dance behind my eyes when I felt a small crunch below my right foot. It made me jump, and though I couldn't hear it, I'm certain the resounding shriek that erupted from my mouth sounded like a small girl rather than the early 30s male that had made it. My right hand scrambled for the wall to steady myself as I tumbled backward, dropping the phone on the lawn. I steadied myself and scooped my phone from the ground. Sweeping the flashlight in front of me, I found what I had stepped on. Thin white bones, no thicker than toothpicks, poked out from a cluster of feathers. A bright skull and beak shattered into tiny shards above it. It was a bird, long decomposed and nothing but a pile of pinions and plumage. The skull must have burst under my feet, sending a jolt up my leg that caused me to stagger away in panic. I had almost begun to laugh at myself for the mild panic when I noticed there were more dead birds. Dozens of them sat in wispy piles like the one I had stepped on. Leaning in to have a closer look, I could see that even though I had only stepped on one, all of their skulls were cracked and broken. It was almost as though they had flown as a cluster into the brick wall, shattering their crowns and killing them instantly. Hot bile boiled at the base of my throat as a more unsettling thought swirled in my mind. These birds have been picked clean. Something else is causing that smell. Hesitantly, I walked toward the corner of the house, 
leaning my head carefully around the corner. Visions of some rotting, shambling horror waiting for me just around the bend flickered in my brain. The light from my cell phone flashlight washed over the yard around the edge. A thick cluster of flies swarmed a few feet away over six black and gray heaps. Red blood pooled on the ground and white maggots writhed on the rotting piles. Six raccoons, a mother with five babies, lay dead against the wall of the house. Blood and flecks of flesh and fur traced along the lowest bricks as though someone had drawn on them with a gore-filled crayon. I stooped down, the stench now swarming through the shirt covering my nose, and looked closer at the animals. Their bloated corpses swarmed with flies, the fur bulging and rippling as small insect larvae crawled just below the surface. The front paws and noses of each were ground down to bloody stumps. I looked back to the bricks, realizing that all six of them had tried to bite and claw their way through the wall, leaving their appendages ragged and shredded. From the amount of blood on the ground, it looked like they had worked at it until they bled to death. I began to retch as I turned and started walking toward the door. The raccoons had killed themselves trying to get inside, but it felt like there was something dangerous nearby, and I desperately wanted to be inside. Perhaps something watching me from the distant wood line at the edge of the barren lot. My hand shook as it grasped the key I had left in the lock. I turned it until I felt the comforting clank of the disengaged deadbolt. I stepped inside, feverishly swatting the wall beside the door in search of a light switch. After a moment of panicked fumbling, the stump of three switches brushed my palm and I pushed them open, flooding the entryway with harsh light. The house was unimpressive, if not strange. Thick carpet, so springy that my feet sank into it deeply, covered the entirety of the floor. Huge squares of black acoustic panels covered every available inch of the tile, swallowing up the light from the industrial-looking fluorescent bulbs hanging overhead. The front door led into a hallway that ran down the length of the house, with two doors on each side. A coat rack was screwed to the wall with four sets of noise-canceling headphones a strange addition to a house owned by a deaf man. To the left of the door sat a single table, the only piece of furniture in sight. On top of it sat three tattered spiral-bound notebooks and a single manila folder. My name was written in a sloppy scrawl with a permanent marker, Edison Kirkwood. I opened the folder to find a letter written in the same haphazard handwriting. Edison, I hope this letter finds you well, young man. If you are reading this, then I am dead, and you have dreadful work ahead of you. When your parents passed away, my heart ached not to bring you into my home, but the nature of my work was far too dangerous to have you here. Now that I am gone, the task has fallen on you. At the end of the hallway between the kitchen and bedroom door, there is an oriental rug. Beneath it is a locked cellar door. The item located within is highly dangerous and should be guarded at all times. While your deafness may have sometimes stifled you in life, it will serve you well here, as it will allow the damned thing no sway over you. In the basement, you'll find an antique. It looks ordinary, but anyone who hears the music it makes will become enamored with it. It drives them mad with envy. They want to own it, to keep it for themselves. They'll hurt anyone who tries to stop them. There is a bank of security monitors in the bedroom that surveil the property, as well as the basement. Watch them diligently. Do not allow anyone into the house unless it is an absolute necessity. If you require any work to be done to the house, the contractors must wear the found headphones above this table. There is a list of recommended repairmen on the fridge that understand the requirement. I suggest you learn to perform most repairs yourself. It is much safer. You'll find a well-stocked tool shed behind the house. There is a wheelbarrow and shovel there for your use as well. Animals are drawn to the object in the basement just as humans. You'll be quite busy keeping the yard clear of them. I am so sorry to have left this burden on you, my boy. Keep it and yourself safe. Miles Kirkwood. I dropped the letter back onto the table and thumbed open the green spiral notebook that sat beside it. There were row after row of dates, times, and notes about animals or creatures on the property. As I flipped through it, 
I could see the recordings in the first notebook went back at least four years. The two below it were just the same. Leaning against the wall and sliding down onto the plush carpet, I landed on my ass and propped my elbows on my knees and rested my head in my hands. I tried to make sense of the strange letter I had just read. It appeared that my uncle had been a wealthy, but most likely mentally ill recluse. It was hard to imagine what evil he stored in the basement, but I was too overwhelmed with the strangeness of the situation to go check. After a few minutes of collecting my thoughts, I pushed myself from the floor, picked up the duffel bag, and slung it over my shoulder. As I padded down the hall, I pushed the doors to each room open. At the front of the house was a small living room, nearly bare except for a single plush recliner and flat screen television. Across the hall was a small dining room with a simple wooden table and a single chair. It painted a lonely picture of a man who never wanted or hoped for any company. Farther down the hall was the master bedroom on the left-hand side. Looking in, I saw a king-sized mattress sitting bare on a four-post bed frame. A stack of neatly folded sheets and an old but ornate quilt sat at the foot, clean and ready for me to sleep on. To the right of the bed sat a bank of black and white surveillance monitors, humming dully in the darkness. I could see flickering images of the main gate, the barren property, and a softly lit room that I assumed was the basement. For a moment, I thought to go inspect the kitchen, but my curiosity for the basement security camera got the better of me. I tossed my bag onto the unmade bed and walked toward the desk. Pulling out the chair, I sat down on the springy desk chair and turned to face the bank of monitors. The monitors around the outside switched between various cameras, displaying images from various angles outside and a few on the front door and entryway. One occasionally flashed on the electric gate at the end of the drive. None of them interested me as much as the one in the center, aimed at a small table, the picture unchanging. An antique phonograph sat atop a white tablecloth on a flat wooden table. The brass bell of the horn reflected the low light glowing from above. At first, I thought it was a small image, but every few moments, a scratch on the record would rotate to just the right angle and catch a flicker from the lamp above. A small item, likely the hand crank, would briefly appear and disappear on the far side of the wooden frame. It must sound beautiful, I thought to myself, and then laughed. It was a strange thought. Having been deaf since birth, I had no idea what anything sounded like and couldn't understand why the musing had entered my mind. I was mesmerized nonetheless. I told myself to get up and go to the kitchen, to make the bed, to do anything, but I already knew where I would go. Standing and pushing the chair away, I walked from the bedroom and into the hallway toward the oriental rug. Pulling it back, I saw a wooden door with brass latches fixed to the edge. I knelt and pulled back the mechanism and the spring-loaded door popped open, revealing a steep ladder into a well-lit basement. Carefully, I put my feet on the narrow rungs and made my way down. The room was empty except for the wooden table. White waves of linen tablecloth fell from the flat surface onto the floor, sitting in a heap on each side. I was certain that my uncle had simply used an old table covering that he already had. It gave off the impression of an ivory waterfall. The phonograph sat carefully in the center, a shellac disc spinning endlessly on the turntable. A needle from the sound box bobbed up and down almost imperceptibly as it turned. The red swirl of the label on the desk was almost hypnotizing. I looked at the phonograph, amazed but confused. Miles Kirkwood had spent a healthy portion of his life watching over an antique record player. It was certainly entrancing, but there were no obvious signs of anything out of the ordinary. But there was. It hadn't occurred to me as soon as it should have, but once I realized it, my sense of unease skyrocketed. Phonographs didn't operate off of electricity. The motor was spring-operated and required you to use the hand crank to wind it up. I had seen the crank spinning independently from the monitor upstairs, and I could see it spinning now. No one had been in the house since my uncle had passed away, and there was only one entrance into the room. It could play no more than a few minutes at a time without being cranked, and no one had touched it. Dread pooling in my stomach, 
I walked toward the table to inspect it more closely. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary about it other than the continuous operation. It looked like nothing more than an interesting, if bland, antique. Grandfather to the vinyl players my parents had listened to, and nothing more. Curious, I reached my hand toward the crank and wrapped my fingers around the handle. To my surprise, the force of the rotation pulled my arm forward as though I had grabbed onto a piece of heavy machinery. Stumbling forward, my free hand moved to stabilize myself, and the palm landed on the rotating disc. Bright pain blossomed on the skin of my hand as it made contact, and I let out my second earth-shattering shriek of the evening. The pain was like nothing I had ever experienced and sent me falling backward to the cement floor. I held my aching palm to my shirt like a wounded animal and was surprised to feel a wet, creeping warmth spread across my chest. I looked down at my aching palm to see blood dripping from my palm onto my jeans. My breathing became labored and I felt lightheaded at the sight. For a moment, I thought I might pass out, but just as my vision was beginning to dim, a bright light began to strobe overhead and I looked up. It was the notification for a hearing impaired doorbell. Someone was at the front gate. With my strange hypnosis broken, I clutched my bleeding hand to my chest and headed back toward the ladder and pulled myself up clumsily from the basement. A deep ache resonated from my palm as I stumbled into the bedroom toward the bank of monitors. I thumbed through the cameras using the old keyboard until a view of the gate popped up. Three black silhouettes stood around the gate. Their black frames stood mostly still in the pixelated frame, but their hands moved slowly over the fence before them. Every few moments, one of them would begin to try and shake the fence with their hand before shifting to another spot, repeating the exercise. The three dark figures turned to face each other and began to talk, pointing toward the house. I was starting to panic, wondering what I would do when the three figures turned back toward the fence and wrapped their hands around the bars. One by one, they jumped and began to scale the sides, sliding down a bit each time they reached up, but making steady momentum toward the top. My temples were pulsing as I scanned the room for something to defend myself with, but I saw nothing of use. Looking back at the screen in terror, I was surprised to see lights begin to flash on the black figures. It was soft at first, pulsing on and off. Moment by moment, the light grew more intense until eventually it became apparent they were the strobes of a police cruiser. In unison, the three black figures slid down the bars of the fence as the cruiser came to a stop behind them. The window rolled down and they stood in a semicircle before the officer. Their heads nodded in recognition and the silhouettes began walking down the road. The cruiser's lights cut off and the car drove away. Sitting in the old desk chair, my shirt clung to my chest with sweat and blood. What had I gotten myself into? Over the next few months, I fell into a comfortable but unusual groove. I stayed at the house all day, every day. A supermarket in the nearest downtown delivered my groceries and a drop box at the front of the property. Anything out of the ordinary, I ordered from Amazon. I read books from daylight till dusk, always sitting at the bank of monitors in the bedroom, but I never went to the basement again. Even being completely deaf, the damn thing had at least some weak hold on me. I'd been transfixed that first night and couldn't stop myself from touching it. The shellac disc had been razor sharp and it seemed like it craved the blood it had drawn from my hand. While I couldn't tell for sure, the picture on the monitor made it look like there wasn't a drop of it left on the rotating piece. It was almost as though it had drunk it. The animals trying to make their way into the house was a constant task. Raccoons, rats, and squirrels would try to burrow through the brick walls of the house until they died of blood loss. At least a dozen birds would slam into the windows each week. I would pull the carry-on flecked wheelbarrow from the rear shed and toss them in using the old shovel. For the first few weeks, I tried to bury them, but it was a never-ending task. So I resigned myself to dumping their bodies in a pile at the back of the property and spreading lime over them. When I wasn't reading, staring at the security monitors or cleaning up the dead animals, I would sit in the overstuffed recliner in the living room and scour online forums. I was never able to find another phonograph that looked exactly like the one in the basement. 
More than once I had considered uploading a photo of it using my cell phone to ask if the antique gurus could identify it, but I always decided not to. It felt like too much of a risk. I did, against my better judgment, get involved in a few forums about haunted houses and strange relics. Most of the posts were absolutely over the top and unbelievable, but hell, my situation was too. Usually, I was just a creeper in the background, reading the other postings, but slowly I started to comment on a few messages. After getting a little more comfortable, I made a posting of my own. I don't remember what I said exactly, but it was vague and didn't mention the phonograph specifically. Just bits and pieces about it being an antique and how the sounds seemed to make animals violent and suicidal. I mentioned how they would try to make their way through the wall, killing themselves in the process. There were a few random comments the first few days, but nothing eventful. The last comment it received, however, gave me a sick feeling in my stomach. Anonymous user 25 said, does it make people act the same way? Like they would hurt someone just to get it? Do people seem drawn to your home? At first, I thought I would ignore the question, but my increasing isolation caused me to make some poor choices in my online interactions. I replied, I haven't seen firsthand examples of how people interact with it, but yes, it seems to draw people or entities to my house. There is a fence around the edge of the property where they seem to hover, but no one has come in yet. A few times they have started to scale the fence, but a police officer has driven by and seems to tell them to head home. As soon as I hit enter, I received this notification. Post removed for violating community guidelines. In frustration, I closed the laptop and tossed it from the chair to the coffee table. Cabin fever was beginning to overwhelm me and the day-to-day -day monotony of maintaining the house combined with the unusual visitors at night was beginning to wear me down. The sun had already dropped behind the horizon by the time I pushed myself up from the chair to get a beer from the kitchen fridge. The flashing light from the gate doorbell stopped me in my tracks. I walked into the bedroom and flopped down into the old desk chair. Scanning the monitors, I wasn't surprised to see a cluster of people wandering around the gate. They milled up and down the road, still looking for weak spots in the gate. A week or so into my stay at the house, I had found a small notebook in a desk drawer with instructions on how to engage an electrified defense system on the fence. So my nighttime visitors had quickly stopped trying to climb over the top. I saw the light of the patrol car began to flicker at the edge of the camera before pulling into view. I sighed with relief, seeing the unnamed officer preparing to clear away the intruders. As always, the window rolled down and the wandering people circled the window, heads nodding. Growing bored of the view, I was about to grab that beer when the people did something I had never seen them do before. They opened the back doors of the cruiser and climbed inside. My heart began to race as the patrol car began to back up and angle its nose toward the gate. It sat idle for a moment, the bright headlights glaring into the camera and obstructing my view. I thought of heading to look out of the front windows, but realized that the tightly locked shutters would block my view, and I had no intentions of going outside to look down the driveway. Nervously, I pulled open the bottom desk drawer and removed a revolver I'd discovered recently. My uncle hadn't left me unarmed, but he had failed to share a good deal of information with me. There was no telling how many other things were in the house he hadn't mentioned. Just as I pushed, the drawer closed. The light's reflection from the camera jolted into life, and I could see the police cruiser's rear tires tossing up a cloud of smoke as it began to speed toward the fence. The heavy rolling gate flew off the hinges and skittered into the yard, digging deeply into the ground. My pulse hammered in my ears as my eyes darted to a monitor observing the driveway to the house. The cruiser was racing down the drive, fishtailing in the gravel and hammering wildly across the barren landscape. Sweat began to pour down my face and I jumped from my chair and headed for the hallway. I kicked the rug away from the trap door and unlatched it. My feet had just hit the second rung of the ladder when I felt an immense jolt to the house. Headlights from the cruiser poured into the hallway the police officer and all of his passengers had just driven the car through the front door of the house. A man in a tan uniform began to clumsily climb through the broken windshield, blood running down his face from an open head wound. I could see others moving in the back, 
trying fruitlessly to push the doors open with no luck. They were pinned shut by the crumbling walls of the house. Another limp figure lay on the hood of the car, half ejected through the cruiser's windshield. Shreds of flesh and waterfalls of rich, dark blood were pouring over the white paneling of the car. The others were making their way through the sliding window in the cab of the cruiser and clawing their way over the dead man hanging from the window. As I looked on, I could see them mouthing the same words over and over. Give us the music! Give us the music! Give us the music! I had been frozen in place, watching the breaching mob clamber from the car until I felt something move by my face. My ear became hot and something wet was gathering on my shoulder. Touching it, I brought my hand away to see fresh blood on my fingers. I looked back toward the car and saw the officer dragging himself with a broken arm, leveling his service revolver at me. He was firing his gun at me and had just grazed my ear. I dropped down the last few rungs of the ladder and pulled the latch shut behind me. The four latch bars slid into their housing, securing the door against the intruders. I hurried across the basement behind the table holding the ever-spinning phonograph. The grip of the revolver was biting into my palm as I used my other hand to press my shirt against my bleeding ear. Feeling terrified and hopeless, I pressed my back into the corner, leveling the gun toward the top of the ladder. Waves of dust began to drift through the air from the support beams overhead, and I could tell the intruders were working to make their way into the basement. The door wouldn't hold forever, and eventually, I would be left with nothing but the six shots loaded into the cylinder before I was at their mercy. The clouds of dust were beginning to thin before disappearing altogether. I stared for a moment, waiting for signs of activity from the intruders, but things had fallen eerily calm. Slowly, I began to make my way toward the hatch to see if they had made any substantial damage to it when another heavy rumble like the car hitting the front wall shook the house. Chunks of wood and the remnants of the trap door fell to the ground. Smoke drifted from a newly formed hole in the floor above. I had fallen to the floor and was scrambling to find the revolver that had just fallen from my hand when something black fell from the hallway above and filled the room with a thick haze of smoke. My hand gripped the lost revolver just as I lost consciousness. When I came to, I was handcuffed to a black table. Saliva puddled around my face. Sitting up, I scanned the room to see a man in a neat suit sitting in front of me. A wall-length, one-way mirror was behind him. He smiled at me and slid a bottle of water toward me. The man began to sign. Would you rather I sign, or can you read lips? I can read lips, I said, tongue smacking the inside of my dry mouth. I picked up the bottle of water and took two long drinks. Who are you, and where the hell am I? The man smiled at me again and pulled a stack of papers from a bag beside him. He slid them to me, letting them rest beside the water. I looked down at the stack and realized it was a lengthy questionnaire. I work for a foundation that keeps the world safe from dangerous anomalies, he replied. Fortunately for you, one of our mobile task force has arrived at your location just in time to save you from meeting a grisly end. The item you guarded has been moved to a secure facility for study and containment. I'll need you to fill out those papers once you've woken up a bit so we can begin to process you. Process me, I asked. For what? Mr. Kirkwood, your uncle did an admirable job of safeguarding the anomaly, and you did fairly well yourself with such a small amount of information. Your disability has put you in a unique position to continue overseeing its containment. I would very much like to discuss with you your future with the SCP Foundation. Listen to more gruesome, horrific, and strange stories like this on my SCP Experience podcast. From run-ins with regular people to riding along with the shadowy organization whose job it is to hunt down SCPs, there's plenty of fun to be had with the SCP Experience. The link is in the show notes below. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.